All right, Revelation chapter 12. Believe it or not, I plan to actually conclude the chapter. <laughs> Took us for, I don't even know how many weeks we've been in chapter 12, but uh, we're going to dig from 10 down through 17. And so there's lots to cover, and I will try to move us along. We're making great time, though, just getting started here at the time of uh, we are, so we should be out early enough. Sun will still be shining. Uh, Revelation 12, let's go ahead and read verses 10 through 17 and then pray and start breaking the verses down. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as of a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away up the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Father, uh, we ask that your spirit would teach us this, this evening out of your precious book. And we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Verses 10 and 11. That's for you. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast out, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Okay, now is come salvation. Where are we here at this point in Revelation? Still in chapter 12. Where were we? Midway point. We're at the... So, just now is come salvation. Well, that's kind of strange. But you've got to just, just note the way God speaks out of time. And it'll help you to understand that every time you read the word now doesn't necessarily mean now the way we look at now. We, you know, we're very momentarily... Uh, minded people. There's still three and a half years of the dragon persecuting the woman. He's saying, now has come salvation. So the Holy Spirit, not bound by time, um, he just has a little different reckoning um, in how time goes and how he deals with time. Um, three and a half years to the Lord, we've talked about this like three and a half hours. You know, I mean, if we were to say, we could legitimately say, yeah, it's now. Even if we were to speak kind of haphazardly in three hours from now, you know, now has come salvation. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And now we see what the devil has actually been up to for the past 2,000 years of church history, standing as prosecuting attorney in God's heavenly court, night and day bringing accusation against particular members of the body of Christ. And I wonder how many of you have been the accused. Strange to even think about it, to ponder it, like, has that actually happened? Has the devil called my name out? I don't know. Are you saved? Are you a, do, you, are, do you sin? He's called your name out. Because all he can think to do is accuse God's people. Um, though we have a formidable foe in the accuser, the good news is that we have a far better defense attorney uh, than money could ever buy. And with that, I want you to keep your place here, go to Job chapter 9. Let's just talk about the defense attorney for a moment. Yes, sir. Oh, that's probably not even recording, is it? Yeah. Very faint. Okay. 
for those, a lot much better, for those who, uh, I'm sorry how quiet we've been, but at least we caught it. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, Job chapter 9. We didn't get too far in, right? Job 9, verses 30 through 33. If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch and mine own clothes shall abhor me. For he is not a man as I am, that I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. What you got here is Job, he's, he's complaining. So I'm not getting a fair shake with God. And there's no one here that can put his hand on me and his hand on God and bring us together. That's what a daysman is. A daysman is a mediator between two opposing parties. Someone to come between God the Father, who is holy, and sinful man, who is less than holy. And in Job's day, he was right, there wasn't. Unless you want to count, and it's just some other time you take a look at it, the author of the book of Job is Elihu. He was the young man that didn't speak until the very end. And he was the only one that God did not condemn. Um, what kind of a type would this Elihu stand as the author of a book of the Bible who spoke truth and only truth? Maybe this will help you. Elihu said to Job, I desire to justify thee. All of his friends wanted to condemn him. But this man stands up and says, now he did lay into Job pretty good, but, but his desire, I want to justify you. Who wants to justify you? The Lord Jesus Christ. So Elihu stands as this type of Christ who's going to stand between the Father's judgment that would have torn Job apart for his being as self-righteous as he had gotten toward the end. And... Uh, stood between him and, uh, uh, and, and Job, who was sinning, and he says, listen, I want to, I want to justify, I desire to justify thee. So I'll just say that though Job knew no daysman, Elihu kind of was that, and he's a portrait and a type of Jesus Christ. But the Bible says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpret, interpreted is God with us, Matthew 1 and verse 23. That child would grow into adulthood without the stain of sin on his soul. And because of that, he was able to die on a cross. And the Bible says that the father made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. Now go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. A daysman was born. Some 2,000 and... Well, if his resurrection was about 1,985 years ago and he was 33, roughly, it'd be some 2,018 years, something like that. 1 Timothy 2, verses 5, 5 and 6. For there is one God and one, what? Mediator. There's a daysman. Be one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So now we have a daysman. We have a mediator between the two opposing parties, sinful man and a holy God. That mediator has a name. And it's not Krishna, it's not the Pope, it's not Buddha, it's not Allah, it's not Baal, it's not Molech, it's not the Easter Bunny, and it's not Santa Claus. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, that's his name. Now look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John 2. Now writing to saved people. 
because yeah, we had we got saved. The save the daysmen went to the cross, but I still sin. Well, verse uh, 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. It's God's plan. I, he doesn't want you to sin, right? Ah, but it doesn't end there. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, he's, an, he's a daysman, he's a mediator, he's an advocate. He advocates for us. He stands on our behalf. So he doesn't just say, well, the job was done. No, now, as much as the devil is accusing, he's advocating. No, 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 you don't understand. That's my child. He's in, my, he's in me. He's washed in my blood. You got no grounds here, Satan. So that all said... When you have nothing, Christian, when you have nothing but accusation to bring about a fellow brother or sister in Christ, who are you acting like? You're acting like the dragon. When you defend your brother or sister with charity, who are you acting like? The Lord of glory. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4.8 All Christians, it's hard because we're in the flesh sometimes, we get angry at one another, but all Christians ought to want to be like Elihu. And the desire should be to justify your brothers and sisters. Not to condemn, to justify them. That's how we ought to be. Now that the inspiration part of the message has been brought forth, back to the doctrinal. There's coming a day in which the accuser, our enemy, he will be cast out of that court of heaven. God will allow the accusations to continue no longer. Aren't you glad? Man, after 2,000 years of listening to it, the broken record, is God long-suffering or what? So he's going to kick him out of heaven. On earth, man has become, at this point, nothing but, this is almost close now, but pure wickedness. And, and Brother Ed and I were talking about this. He made a good point. We were talking about that, um, that story that keeps coming up on Sunday about the Santa Barbara um, uh, professor. And when I shared that story with him, he said, I'll tell you, he goes, there's the wickedness that we all have. He goes, and then there's what the Bible discusses as the wicked. You know, there are people that are just wicked. Just hate God hate Christians, are so opposed to the truth of the word of God, and not even just dislike it, but stand against it. They withstood our words. That's what the apostles said. Uh, but the God of this world, Satan, according to the Bible, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he will be forced to dwell in his own kingdom. See, he's kind of like politicians of today. Wanting to rule the kingdom but not believing he should have to lower himself to their estate and hang out with them. Isn't that interesting? It's his, it's, he's the God of this world, and he's angry that he's going to be put down into the earth. Typical politician. So what the Antichrist is a typical politician. I want to rule you. I don't want to be here with you. It's despicable to me. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Because our daysman grew from a child into a man without that stain of sin upon his soul, he was able to office, offer the purchase price for the sins of the world. The church of God, according to the Bible, was purchased with his own blood. Acts 20, verse 28. The Bible also says, I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. 1 John 2, 14. Year of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 4 and verse 4. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, first and foremost. That's how we overcame, by the blood. 
and in this particular group by the word of their testimony. And I don't know if you've ever taken any time to consider this, but in part, having victory over the dragon is by spreading your testimony. You say, well, what testimony? The, the same testimony that Paul spread, how he got saved. The same testimony that you're to spread, how you got saved. You have a testimony of salvation, right? Or are you just going to church? And that's why spiritual attacks happen when you give out the word. Because if you think about this, if you use this verse, which it's as legitimate as any other verse of the Bible, but if you were to use this verse and say that you overcome Satan by your testimony, then what's happening when you spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and you spread your testimony of getting saved, what you're doing is going on the attack against the devil's kingdom. And so anyone that's under attack is going to go, oh, oh, and they're going to start firing back. Well, that's what happens. That's why, why is there always that knock on the door when I'm you know, sharing the gospel? Why is there always, when I finally have someone's attention, why does the phone ring ten times? And, and I've experienced this when you're at the height of the end of that message and you're driving that thing home, all of a sudden every child needs, needed to go to the bathroom. You know, and there was just distraction after distraction. And that's how he plays because, I mean, those are his fiery darts. It's not, he's not, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Right. These are spiritual attacks. We've got to recognize them. That's why there's been times, and I know I've been, because I've been given the look by some people, when I say, stop, don't worry about that look here. Because then you look arrogant. But I know what's going on. I know what's going on when we're getting distracted and it's time to really hit this thing home. So um, I've learned that over the years and that's why I say things to, <laughs> to people when I get a distraction at work and I was given the gospel and that what I'm sure was a devil-possessed uh, lesbian woman walked by and barked when I was given the gospel and you know I called her a child of the devil and told her to get out. And she did. But I recognized it for what it was. And maybe, I don't know if she's devil-possessed or not. I don't know. There's no, there was no um, name tag that said, Hi, I'm so-and-so and possessed of the devil. Um, but barking. <laughs> keep walking by and bark. And then come back around and bark. And then come back around and bark until finally I couldn't take it anymore. So, yeah, the devils still exist. Don't let the scientists who are as dumb as a box of frozen hamburger, don't let them dictate truth to you. Let the Bible dictate the truth to you. Uh, so you're on offense, and he's on defense, and he'll start to fire back. They love not their lives unto death, and I want to let you know something. Because you enter into a spiritual battlefield when you give your testimony, I've got to be honest with you folks, your life may be at stake. Well, that's not making me go out to the streets. Why not? Don't you know at least you're doing something of eternal value? If i got to go out, we're all going out. If we're not raptured, we're all going out. If I'm going out, we might as well go out with a bang. I'm still, my wife and I are still convinced that someone's going to put a gun to my head that's <laughs> just waiting for that day. And I, and I can joke about it. People get all worked up like, well, don't say that, don't say it. What? I don't know that it's going to happen, but it could. Bang. Instantly in heaven. No, please don't. <laughs> the only thing holding me back here are my boys. Because I want to, it's not even so much I want to see them grow up, I hope. Hope, pray that they get saved and I'll see them for all of eternity. But I don't want to leave them behind without a daddy. You know, That's why our prayer has always been, let's all go together. I want it to be the rapture. I don't, even want, I don't want this body to see death. But if it does, freak accident, man. Take us all out. Jump. They just jumped. I couldn't understand. They went right over the cliff. <laughs> Today, we live, uh, well, we in America, 
we live in a land that has um, a liberating document known as the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We are allowed to share that testimony uh, with, with government protection. That's how it's supposed to be uh, for now. We still enjoy it. If someone comes over and wants to kill me while I'm preaching, I can call the police and they will protect me for now. There may, and this is going to be part of what's going on, what we'll talk about on, on Sunday, but there, there may come a day um, in that which is reality for those in the tribulation saint, uh, and for those saints, there may come a day when that happens here in modern reprobate America. I hope it doesn't, but I'd rather hear the Trump sound first. But I don't know if we will hear that Trump before the real rough times fall upon us. And you just look around, just see what, see what. Um, and this isn't even this. It's spiritual and it's not spiritual. And what I mean by that is that the things going on governmentally. Uh, I don't know if it's a spiritual attack. I don't know if it's God's judgment upon America. But I can tell you this, that the decisions that the powers that be are making, this, they either are the dumbest people ever or they're purposely trying to destroy this country. I believe it's the latter. So that could, I mean, it's, and it's at an exponential rate. The things that they're doing, I mean, they're just, you hear about the, well, get off track here, but um, we all know the New York Safe Act, the despicable Nazi-ish law that should not exist. Um, yesterday was the deadline to register those guns. Over a million people in New York um, basically gave the middle finger to Prince Cuomo and said, we're not doing it. A number of people showed up to protest and they filled out the paperwork, registration paperwork at the protest and brought shredders and then shredded them after they did it. And they said uh, the purpose that they said, and they're right, so they said, well, if our politicians are going to shred the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, we're going to shred their laws. Amen. Hallelujah. Let someone stand. We need more pastors standing. All right. Verses 12 and 13. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. When the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Okay, so, so the heavens rejoice because they are no longer defiled by the twisted serpent Leviathan. He has no jurisdiction there any longer. The earth, however, she is going to mourn. Woe is pronounced against her. Why? Well, now you're dealing with a, you're dealing with a strange situation here. The last three and a half years of tribulation is defined by, number one, the wrath of God. It is the wrath of God poured out upon man, and the wrath of the dragon will be here. So both the greatest force of good and the greatest force of evil will concentrate their anger here. Um, the Holy Ghost says they, they've shed blood, the blood of the saints and the prophets. Thou hast given them blood to drink. They're worthy. So God's wrath will be here. I mean, give them blood to drink. That's Revelation 16. We'll get to that. But here and now, right here at this point, midway, wrath of the dragon. And it's going to be focused in particular on the woman, Israel. But it will spill over into other nations. Why? Because he needs to have nations go against Israel. So all this is going to be, if his wrath will still, it'll, be, it'll affect nations all over the place. He's going to just suck them in to hate Israel. Verse 14. And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Okay, well, we covered this. This is basically verse 6 again. Um, we covered the fact that there's going to be a second wilderness wandering in which God 
will feed the Jewish remnant uh, with manna from heaven. We don't need to go over it all again. It was a great study. If you did not hear it, download it. It was... Uh, that's not me tooting me, that, you know, my horn. That's me saying there's cool stuff in the Bible. Um, so, um, but again, we don't need to cover that tonight. But I do want you to note a particular thing here, and then we'll move on. It says, and, the, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Okay, before anyone assumes, as do some of the prophecy writers of today's day, that the eagle's wings are represent, representative of America's jets, Flying the Jews to safety. Let's look at a couple verses. Go to Exodus 19. Did you know that that's what a lot of the commentators, the modern ones, are saying? Well, the eagle, that's America. And so that's the. Now, listen, I understand. There may be some hinting at America and an eagle, and we'll talk about that with Isaiah 18 one of these years if we get to it. But. Um, I'm just going to show you from the Bible how what they're thinking here. I, I don't listen. I don't see America in the end times, other than maybe supporting Antichrist. So I don't see them being the lone voice of let's carry the Jews into safety. Whatever. Our our current president would be happy to open the floodgates of the dragon upon Israel. Upon Israel. And if you don't believe me, uh, just look at his record. Um, Exodus 19. Verses 3 and 4. Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. What are we dealing with? We've already had the Exodus, right? Verse 4. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. God likened the first escape into the wilderness like unto eagles' wings, without the use of American ingenuity. Go figure. It was by the strength of the Lord's hand. By the strength of my right hand. Look at Deuteronomy 32 while we're close by. We're there in the law. A couple few books over, Deuteronomy 32. Uh, verses 11 and 12. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him. And there was no strange God with him. Doing it again. And, and it, isn't it interesting he puts the word alone in there? See, so you, didn't, you didn't need a strange God like Baal or Molech or Ashtaroth saying to the Jews. And today you don't need the American Air Force when you have the Lord God on your side. America has nothing to do with what's going on in Revelation chapter 12. Again, unless they're stomping on Israel. And maybe, I mean, maybe they won't. But either way, I can't give them credit here. God is doing this, all right? Um, but, yeah, yeah, all right, I won't get into that. But, Listen, if God can transfer Philip, the evangelist, and you read about that Acts 8, uh, verses 39 and 40, in one moment, he's just caught up in a whirlwind and he's in another place, and he can do that with Elijah, and he can do that with uh, Jesus was gone, and then there in the room, and then not in the room, and God can do that. He can do the same thing with the remnant of Israel without American soldiers, Americans think all prophecy is about America. Hardly. You gotta stop thinking like Americans and like that we're some great thing. That's what Rome thought. That's what Greece thought. That's what Babylon thought. That's what Egypt thought. One by one, they all dropped. Verses 15 and 16. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away up the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Um, I can remember reading these verses early on in my Christian walk and thinking, uh, what is that? A flood out of the dragon's mouth? 
what? What is <laughs> right? I mean, why out of his mouth? Blah, you know, and what kind of what are we talking about here? Um, and there's a couple of different perspectives here, and I would say that both are probably legitimate um, Bible teachings. Pick one or the other, or both. Um, first, this could be a literal flood. The Bible says flood. Okay, I can accept that. Um, uh, out of his mouth would be that he commanded it somehow to happen, um, given the orders. If we take the Bible literally, which we can and should, unless the Bible itself dictates that we shouldn't, so that's a possibility. And then the earth will open up and uh, consume the water. Or, second, this can be a military attack, um, and it can be represented as a flood. And I have Bible for that, so go to Isaiah 59. And there's more verses than just what I'm going to give you. There's lots of verses in the Bible. The flood could be symbolic language. And it would make sense in Revelation 12 because it's used symbolic language all the way throughout. Isaiah 59, verses 19 and 20. And that, by the way, when you're doing, when you're doing Bible study, um, pay attention to what's around it, what the chapter does. Um, for instance, you know, uh, the, in the charismatic movement, the popular teaching is that a manifestation of the Spirit in you is that you speak in tongues. And they believe that all people should speak in tongues or they're not manifesting the Spirit. And yet in Corinthians it says, do all, do all prophesy? Do all, and you go, it goes through all this list. And to everyone, the charismatic will go, no, 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 no. Do all speak in tongues? Yes. <laughs> you can't do that to the Scripture. You know, so, and here it's symbolic, 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 symbolic. It's okay if you're going to say symbolic. He's already set the precedent. You understand what I'm saying? All right, so Isaiah 59, verses 19 and 20. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. So in verse 19, the flood of an enemy. Who's the enemy? Well, the devil and his children, for one. Acts 13 and verse 10 would say that. But look at verse 20 that follows. What follows the enemy's attack? The return of Jesus Christ. This prophecy fits exactly what's going on here. So... Um, Note that an armed enemy is referred to as like a flood. And again, there are lots of places in the Bible. This is only one of many. Um, or this, again, this could literally be a flood that Satan pours out after the Jew. Again, how is that, you know, how is that possible? How could he do that? And my response really is, I don't know. But there are many supernatural things that make us question the validity of it all when supernatural things happen. I simply believe that there are spiritual beings that exist out there that are far more powerful than man and that they are more capable of doing things that mortal man is incapable of doing. And I don't have a problem with believing it. I don't have to know how the devil will do it. I only know that he could order it and it'll happen. Why? He's a prince here. He's the god of this world. He has jurisdiction here. He can make things happen. He's a mover and a shaker. The earth will open up and swallow the flood, according to verse 16. So whether this is a military attack or a literal water flood, either way, the earth will do what she once did uh, in the first wilderness wandering. Remember when Pharaoh's army came after the Jews? Okay. They fled into the Red Sea. The sea swallowed them up, right? Well, you say, well, that's the sea that swallowed them up. That's not the earth doing the swallowing up. Watch how the Bible words what happened during that time. Go back to Exodus chapter 15. So I don't know if this will literally be the earth opening up or if the flood will actually, if there will be a flood and it'll kill his soldiers. But watch this, Exodus 15, verses 9 through 12. 
The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like, uh, uh, like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Well, wait a minute. In verse 10, God says the sea covered them, and then verse 12 says the earth swallowed them. Which is it? Yes. It's just the way God worded it. So, well, what does that mean for Revelation? I don't know. One of the two. He can also open up the earth. He did that with the sons of Korah, and they dropped in. So, but um, it could be. So, what I'm saying is that it could be a literal flood that God opens up the earth, the waters go in. It could be the army coming after God opens the earth and it comes in. Or it could be a combination of flood waters and the army, and then God using the flood that came out of uh, Satan's mouth and using it against him, just like he used the waters against Pharaoh. So, so which is it? I don't know. Who here has a market on the book of Revelation? Uh, also in verse 14, we see the reference to a time and times and half a time, which lines up again with verse 6. That references 1,203 score days. They're both equal in time. It's 1,260 days. A time, which is equivalent to a year in Scripture, times two years, um, and half a time, half a year. So that's one year plus two years plus a half a year, three and a half years, which is, on a Jewish calendar, 1,260 days. So we're looking, again, we've got a verily, verily, um, or just two, a guy putting an exclamation point on what he's saying. There's still, there's two and a half, or three and a half years left here. This is the midway point. Verse 17, and we'll be done. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 10 and verse 20 says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped out of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them but shall stay upon the Lord the Holy One of Israel in truth so they were trusting in that Antichrist and he smote them and there's coming a day that a remnant will not lean upon Antichrist they will lean back upon the Lord God always preserves a remnant of his people a faithful remnant in today's day there is a remnant of Bible-believing uh, Christians, Bible-believing people out there uh, left of all Christians, and Christendom is large, but there's only a small remnant of people who actually still believe this book. I believe our church is one of them, and it's small. It's a small remnant. Um, during the tribulation, there will be a remnant of the nation of Israel, that will not accept the Antichrist rule. And um, they will be converted and believe that Jesus Christ was, is, always will be the Messiah that they had been longing for. They will mourn for him according to the book of Zechariah. Um, it'll be like they're giving birth again. It'll be like, um, so there's a number of typologies. Birth, it'll be like pain, it'll be like death, like they lost somebody, they'll mourn for him and weep for him, um, but they'll be converted. And um, they will both keep the commandment of God, like the Jew of old, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, like, do, like as we do. And hallelujah. So all of Israel, according to the scripture, shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's Romans chapter 11, verse 26. All right, and that ends Revelation chapter 12. It's only going to heat up from here. Because the next chapter deals with what? Antichrist and the false prophet. So it's going to get it's going to get steamy. So uh, anyhow, I'm looking forward to teaching it. Hopefully, you're looking forward to studying it. And for now, let's just close with prayer. Uh, Father, we want to thank you for your book. The amazing things we find in it. We want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on that cross for us. And this coming Sunday, Lord, I don't know what the exact date was. 
And I know that there are a bunch of pagans that get together and worship false things. But this Sunday, we plan to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't have to just be this Sunday, but every day in our heart. But in particular, this day, we kind of go all out. And Lord, I just pray that you would be with us as we deliver that word. Lord, may your spirit go forth powerfully among the people. Teach, preach, convert souls, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.